Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. We're recording this episode on April the 22nd, 2020, and I have with me again today Dr. Greg Poland, who's an infectious disease and, bi and virology expert from the Mayo Clinic. Thanks for being here, Dr. Poland. Always enjoy it. I wonder if you'd start out today by just sharing us the latest numbers that you're hearing and uh, what's going on with the pandemic. Sure. Uh, well, worldwide, we're at about 2.6 million cases. Uh, on Monday, when we spoke just a couple of days ago, it was about 2.4. So, you know, this is still a rapidly moving uh, pandemic. In the U.S., we're at uh, just about 820,000 cases. We were at 765,000 on Monday. We have about a uh, little over 45,000 deaths. On Monday, we're, we were at about 40,000 deaths. So while those numbers are still high, one is beginning to sense that, that they're plateauing. Um, and as we've talked about this lag period between when you get exposed and when you get sick enough to be counted can be 14 to 28 days or so. So we're just starting to see that plateau and the hard part will be the patience to continue this for, you know, perhaps another month or so. You talked a little bit about the numbers and it's the still, we're still seeing infections. Does uh, living in households convey any um, risk for transmission? What do we know about that since we've all been social distancing and, and concentrating and focusing yeah. on that so much? There was a study just uh, released from, from China that was a household transmission study. They, uh, and I'll just look at the numbers here, they had uh, 105 people that were infected, 392 household members, all uh, who were tested with RT-PCR. If you look at the secondary attack rates, it was 17% in adults. So in other words, if I'm sick, what's the risk that my wife or another adult in the household would get uh, infected? It was about 17%, about 4% for kids. Um, if that index case quarantined themselves with all the measures we've talked about, household transmission was zero. So it really works. The, core, the other side of that coin was, well, what about the spouse where there'd be, you know, the most intimate contact? That attack rate was about 28%. It, these measures are important. I know sometimes I get questions from people saying, well, if somebody in my household has it, isn't it inevitable? As a matter of fact, you can drive that to zero. And that's a remarkable thing, speaking to the power of hand washing, respiratory etiquette, and appropriate isolation and quarantine. Well, that is really amazing, because if yeah. you think about uh, all the same surfaces that are shared in a household, uh, et cetera, maybe it gives us hope for going back to work and, and, and doing other activities with proper precautions at some point during Indeed. this. There is such a dizzying array of tests for COVID-19 being uh, discussed uh, in the media and otherwise, both tests for do I have it now and serology tests for did I ever have it. There's talk about household kind of tests that can be done at home. Is this likely to become uh, a reality and would it help with the, the testing numbers that we're seeing where, where there's just not enough capability to test? Well, you know, you've, you've put your finger on a, an absolutely key issue in terms of how do we intelligently reopen and how would we intelligently reclose this fall, which many of us think is, is likely. And the key to that is going to be testing. Otherwise, we have no real idea of the amount of community transmission that's occurring. The problem is in the rush to get these tests out, the FDA has issued emergency use authorizations. And what that means is that they haven't gone through the usual very careful clinical testing that we would normally put a, a test that's gonna be used in humans through. So uh, some studies have suggested that the sensitivity, and what that means is if I actually am infected and you do this test on me, what's the chance that it will be positive? Might only be about 50%, 5-0, a flip of a coin. Uh, and so I think before we really have widespread testing, we're gonna need assays that have been validated and where we know uh, are they going to be appropriate and give us uh, good intelligence. 
The other test that uh, was just released, which is an interesting one, is the idea of uh, allowing people to have at home a swab test. So this is not, have I been infected? It's, am I infected now? Um, and what they're proposing, at least this uh, company that's released it, is to put what looks like a Q-tip just into the you know, first half inch or inch of the, of the nose and doing that on both sides. We have no idea how good that assay is. We know that in general, you have to do a nasopharyngeal swab, which goes up quite a bit uh, into the nose and nasal passages. Uh, it's uncomfortable. Somebody's unlikely to do that to themselves on, on their own. Um, and they're gonna start with using it in healthcare workers and first responders. So it's, it's something that holds promise, but I think we need to see the data. A little while ago, we were hearing an awful lot about hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin in combinations. Even President Trump was talking about it on some of his uh, daily updates. Uh, so much so that uh, here at Mayo, we had to put limits on how people prescribe to those medications and when uh, no. to preserve the supply. What do we know at this point about whether those are effective for treating COVID-19? Let me make a comment because I think it, it pertains to so much surrounding this pandemic. There is, of course, immense pressure and desire to get things out quickly, whether it's a drug, a test, a vaccine. And, and one understands that and has great empathy for people, healthcare workers, et cetera, who, who need to know and want to know. But there is no substitute for the careful patience of scientific work. Let's just take this example of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. A lot of pressure, public and otherwise, as you said, to do something and, and use this. But we now have two pretty good studies that are showing uh, one study done in, in the VA that there was no benefit to this. Another study from France showing there was no benefit to either one or combination of those, and in fact, evidence of harm. And as you and I know, some of those drugs uh, can do things to the heart rhythm, like prolong some of the electrical activity and actually cause harm if they're not monitored. Again, I think this is really important because it says now when we've actually done the clinical trials, is all this enthusiasm warranted? And more and more data is accumulating to say no, and in fact, there might be harm. Now, other antiviral drugs like remdesivir, which we've talked about, it is, a, is a different story. We have some encouraging news there. Well, we look forward to hearing more as more develops. We've heard about risks for patients and what makes COVID mm -hmm. worse for some patients, mm -hmm. perhaps male, different age groups, et cetera. Are there other risk factors that are becoming known that affect uh, either the development of COVID-19 or how the, the virus progresses and illness for those patients? And that's an area where, you know, inside 14, 15 weeks, we've developed a lot of knowledge. So I think everybody's familiar with the fact that older age, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, things like that are risk factors. Um, we have not seen pregnancy be a risk factor for complicated disease. And I have to say that's a surprise given how pregnancy is, is very much a risk factor for influenza. Uh, smoking is turning out, of course, uh, no surprise there to be a risk factor. But a couple of things that are, are a little bit interesting here and that we don't have an answer for. One is that males of any age seem to have more severe disease than females. So I mentioned of any age because it's not simply hormonally driven. There's something else happening there in our, our host genes. Um, the other thing is that obesity, now we did know that from, from flu, so it's not that much of a surprise, but obesity is turning out to be a risk factor that may increase your risk of severe disease by as much as twofold. So we're beginning to get a more and more complete picture. The other thing that uh, just recently has been reported is uh, about five cases of Guillain-Barre. This is an ascending paralysis. This can happen with a variety of viral uh, and parasitic infections. It can happen from influenza. 
Um, and now we're starting to see some cases as a result of COVID-19. Not very many, um, but nonetheless, case reports here and there. There's a report that came out of South Korea of about 140 patients, I believe, who had um, been tested positive with COVID-19, mm -hmm. then seemed to recover, and now again tested positive. Uh, what do you make of that? Yeah, you can imagine the, the concern that this has raised, and it's a very complicated issue. Uh, I think probably one of two things is happening. One is maybe just variability in testing. I do not believe that these people have recovered and then that quickly been reinfected. That would not be consistent with everything we know about the human immune system. So it's either variability in testing or one part of that can be, remember that the RT-PCR assay the diagnostic assay, is just detecting pieces of the virus. It doesn't mean that there's virus in there that's, so to speak, live and capable of infecting somebody else. It could be residual pieces of the virus that are there as part of your recovery. Um, so what they're doing, and it's an appropriate step, though as you might imagine, uh, has some uh, risk uh, associated with it, is they're actually culturing that virus in human cells in a test tube to see, are we actually seeing live virus or just these pieces? The same thing has happened in regard to uh, checking stool specimens. Some people are shedding virus for as long as 30 days. Does that mean they're infectious? We, we don't know. And in fact, some countries, some locales in the US, the country of France and others, are actually going to wastewater and sewage treatment plants and looking for evidence of the virus. And what they've noticed is that this is the other side of the disease, is before people have actual symptoms, they can detect at the population level virus in the wastewater, in the sewage. And they know that in five days, they're going to start seeing cases. So we're learning a tremendous amount here. The, the trick will be putting it into the proper context and understanding it. You talked a little bit earlier about how it may be necessary to be reactive. So in other words, that as we begin to open, we may see changes in, in the incidence um, or even this second wave of infections that I've been hearing about. What does that mean and when might it happen? Uh, as, as somebody who studies these viruses and as a vaccinologist, I have I'll say it, grave concern. When you think about this COVID-19 outbreak in the U.S., it started in mid to late February. So we were, in fact, past our influenza epidemic. It's unlikely that will happen this fall. Rather, we will have, in a perfect overlapping fashion, influenza epidemics and COVID recurrence occurring. The problem is that the symptoms overlap nearly exactly, particularly initially. The second is the tremendous surge demand on the medical system. And the third will be the anxiety around that. And do we really close everything down again and do what we've just been through over the last uh, you know, several months? Uh, this remains to be seen. I think what's going to be really key, and we have difficulties with getting people to take flu vaccine, what's really going to be key is to encourage everybody six months of age and older, which is the recommendation, to get a flu vaccine, and in this case, to get it as early as it's available, not wait until December and January. Oh, you have done countless interviews since uh, this this has all begun and even in the last couple of months i'm sure you've lost count by now yeah. but i'm wondering what is the most common question that you get asked in interviews hmm. uh, probably the first one i get is and and people kind of hang their head and say when is this going to all be over um, and i don't know the answer to that question if i'm honest about my my guesstimate and it's just that a guesstimate no earlier than the winter of 2021. And then people will tell me about symptoms they've had and will ask me, do you think I had COVID? 
And, you know, the answer to that is evolving because what we're learning is that a lot of people have been infected and don't know it or had very minimal symptoms that they didn't attribute uh, to, to COVID. What, what's the evidence for me saying that? Well, just recently um, in LA, in California, they've done wider spread testing. I think they've tested about 700,000 people, something like that. Lo and behold, about four plus percent of them are testing positive. So by antibody tests, meaning that they had been infected. And uh, as we talked about, the numbers are probably even higher than that because the serology tests are not quite where they need to be. And I think in, in various locations in the U.S., we're going to find out that a lot of us probably were infected and really didn't know it or attributed it to, you know, quote, the flu or, or something like that. That would be very valuable to know. It would be very reassuring. And it would be a key piece of how we, in a careful, staged way, phase back into normal operations. Some sobering information, actually. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us before uh, we go today, Greg? You know, I, I think uh, the one thing, and we've touched on it sometimes, uh, that, that I would encourage all of our listeners to, as we all are, learn from this. And that is, we are a bit cavalier in our culture about respiratory diseases. It's just the flu or, well, I just have a little cough. And people go to work, they go to school sick, they visit people in nursing homes and the hospitals when they're ill. I think one of the things that I'm hoping will come out of this is that people will take respiratory diseases and the vaccines that we have available for them much more seriously and will be uh, more zealous in, in guarding one another uh, against the widespread transmission of these diseases. These masks might be here to stay for a while. Huh? So. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Greg Poland, a virologist and infectious disease expert from Mayo Clinic, who we've been visiting with today. And thank you all for joining us on Mayo Clinic Q&A. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.